Okay, next up we have um, our panel, but I'm going to introduce the uh, facilitator for this. This panel is looking at state operational perspective on regional resilience with the private sector. Uh, what a best, what a great place to start with states, right? And we just learned over our experience that uh, this type of problem solving at the operational level is really bottom up, and you really got to coordinate with states, and they're hard to coordinate with sometimes. The elections, the turnover, people like that. Um, so we have a great panel today to talk about this that have been through the fire, which I love. So let me introduce Persia Payne Hurley. Persia is the coordinator, um, really director of their business emergency operations center, where they support about 900 members in the private sector that all coordinate with the EOC, with Persia's program, to share information real time, resolve issues, problem solving. It's an amazing effort. Persia also mentors um, over a dozen other states and probably more than I even I'm aware of and helping them get their programs put together as well. She's a, uh, a former uh, army uh, logistician and uh, was not formally with government. And she says that gave her an advantage when she was getting started. Uh, so Persia is gonna introduce the panel and get into it. So let me uh, welcome Persia, thanks for joining us. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay, I'm Persia. Thanks, Tom, for that introduction. Um, this event that we're about to get into is the main event before the main events. The famous and always popular directors panel. I know that you're excited, me too. Um, we are gonna dive into state private sector programs and business emergency operations centers, the innovation solutions um, that are developed between the states and the private sector. So it's gonna be fantastic. And we're going to talk about what they've been doing through the pandemic and these disasters, natural and man-made, that just don't stop. So first allow me to define and clarify what we mean by private sector, this definition. For our slice of emergency management, private sector means corporate and business owners, operators, folks in private industry with interests across business sectors, primarily but not limited to operations, logistics, transportation, shipping, utilities, Critical infrastructure, security, business continuity. Also, we're talking about uh, private sector high value locations and elements such as supply chain, healthcare, data centers, manufacturing, the lifelines, of course, uh, and those adjacent essentials that send ripples into these primary components like the workforce, research, and development. So, we're talking about industries, food, growers, packers, restaurants, lodging, manufacturing, EIEIO, right? It's a big private sector world out there and servicing our communities every day. And in this environment, there are implications as we understand from our, for our citizens, our families, uh, and for the economic strength of any state. So I've got the honor to open the director's panel. This one is always exciting, riveting, inspiring, hard hitting, and we get to be inside the heads of these thought leaders. So it, it's like instant brain growth. Uh, I, I love to do this, and uh, I, think, I thank the All Hazards Consortium for letting me do it again this year. So I promise you're going to love this. Since there's really no such thing as walking before you run in our business, we will uphold that fine tradition today. We're going to run and then reminisce about walking. So let's jump right in and get comfortable. I'm thrilled today that we have four state directors hailing from great states. Welcome, please, Director Jeff Thomas from Pennsylvania. Director Brian Hastings of Alabama, Director Casey Tingle of Louisiana, and Director Will Ray of my home state, North Carolina, my newly minted and already awesome boss. Gentlemen, welcome. The panel is yours. Thanks, Roger. All right. If we can get you going here, I want each of you to take a minute, we'll go around the horn, I want you to introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about you. And because we're special, personal friends, tell us what you love most about doing what you do. And I wanna start with Director Thomas. Hey, thanks, Persia. So easy to see on the screen, I'm Jeff Thomas. I'm the Executive Deputy Director of the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency. And I, and I think like most, I've been doing this a long time. So <laughs> I think like most folks that do this, uh, you do this because you just have that. Uh, most of us come from uh, some type of public uh, service. My, my background was law enforcement and corrections. You talk to the other folks, they're gonna have similar backgrounds, military, law enforcement, corrections. Other people that just kind of wanna do public service and help folks. 
And I will tell you, probably the most rewarding thing to me is uh, after a major disaster, one of the hurricanes, or we were more uh, tropical storms and hurricanes in this area, a lot of flooding, to be able to help folks that really three days before that had no idea what they were going to do is extremely rewarding and, and probably the reason that I come to work. Persia, you are muted. Thank you for that. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Let's go to Director Hastings, Alabama. Hey, good morning, Persia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I was still, I was like massaging my cheeks from that intro, Persia. You were cracking me up, so I appreciate that. I just got off of a, a FEMA NAT call. So uh, I'm an extrovert. Uh, I like being involved. I've been a public servant since I graduated from high school, retired 27 years from the Air Force. Uh, in my previous life, I was winning hearts and minds 30 millimeter at a time and doing large landscaping with an A-10. So on the other side of the coin, um, I'm still giving back to the community by trying to save lives, change how we do business, build resiliency, and still trying to be active. And so some of the things I'm involved right now in is uh, I'm the chairman of the Central U.S. Earthquake Consortium. Out of that was a spinoff of the private sector of the, the Consortium of Emergency Service Technology. I'm the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee for NEMA, plus I'm on the legislative and the uh, DEI committee for that. I'm the co-chair of Legal Services Corporation Disaster Task Force back in 2018 and 19 for preparing uh, low-income families for disaster the co-chair for the National Homeland Security Consortium. And then I'm also uh, a dad of three boys and married to Lope Aline here in Alabama. And it's great to be here with everyone. Thanks, Persia. Director Hastings, I'm not doing nearly enough, sir. I don't see. <laughs> let's, let's go on down to the Gulf, Director Tingle. Hey, good afternoon. And uh, thank you for the <clears throat> opportunity to participate in the panel and to give you know, just a little bit of the perspective from Louisiana. Uh, it's great to be a part and, and Persia, thank you for your leadership of the panel. Um, just a little bit about me. So I'm, I'm, I'm new to the director's role, only been in this spot officially uh, a couple of weeks now, um, but I've been with the agency since 2009. So I've seen um, our state and, and from a response and a recovery perspective from a variety of of different types of events. Uh, certainly the pandemic has been particularly challenging for us in a number of ways. Uh, and the last two hurricane seasons have been devastating for large parts of uh, our state. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, what inspires me to do what it is that we do here at GOSEP is um, both the opportunity to try to do what we can to keep people from having their, their worst day um, and then the opportunity to kind of meet them where they are when they have their worst day, whether that's the, um, you know, the destruction of their community, losing their house or, or being displaced or something like that. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we try to do everything we can to, to think about this from a personal perspective and, and what would it be like to have, you know, to put ourselves in the shoes of someone who's facing those circumstances many times, you know, having little opportunity to do much about it. So uh, really the opportunity to, to help our people, um, whether that's mitigation and, and doing whatever we can on the front end, um, but certainly after something happens, uh, doing whatever we can to affect, you know, a, a positive outcomes through recovery for them uh, at the end of the day, I think is, is why we keep showing up and trying to do our very best for the people of Louisiana. No, I understand, sir. Um, thank you. And Director Ray, I'm so excited you're here. Thanks, Persia. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I would probably be wise if I just stepped back and ceded all of my time to Persia uh, and let her take the ball from here. I think that would be the smartest move. Um, I think, again, selfishly, we're very happy and very fortunate and feel very blessed to have her as a part of our team here. Um, as well um, as Director Tingle, I'm relatively new uh, to the director's position. I started uh, here in North Carolina on the 1st of August um, and um, had, I think, the second weekend, Tropical Storm Fred 
hit us. So my you know, first 100 day plan went directly out the window and has stayed out the window ever since then. Um, I've been with the agency since 2018, um, first as an assistant director for planning and homeland security, and then, uh, uh, then as the chief of staff for, for the division. My experience really started um, locally. So um, I started in local emergency management, local public health preparedness, um, and have uh, really stayed in the public health preparedness healthcare realm um, until I came over here in, in 2018. Um, I think similar to the other panelists that have shared, I think um, every day being able to work with this agency is such a privilege. Um, I think the role of emergency management is evolving and expanding um, as we look at events that we're having to confront, but also just, I think, the expectations of the agencies. And um, I, th I think it's exciting to me to have a staff team that at the end of the day, we are, again, I think as Director Tingle and, and, and some others said, trying to prevent that worst day, but when we can't prevent the worst day to be able to come alongside and support the recovery and resiliency of every North Carolinian, I think is, is such an incredible privilege. And I think, I think we're at a time here with the involvement of emergency management as a field that um, we are really being seen as a blender more and more of that being that glue and being that linkage uh, for other public safety agencies. And I think the last couple of years has certainly reinforced that with some of the events that we are continuing to work through and, and, and have worked through. So very happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part um, of this panel um, along with you, Persia, and uh, the other distinguished panelists. Thank you, sir. See, you guys are gonna see just how, how great he is today. I'm gonna stay right there with you, uh, Director Ray, on our first question. We're gonna go counterclockwise now. Uh, be advised that uh, and Tom Moran may jump in with follow-up questions. He's known to do that at any time. So for our first question, how has the challenge of responding to disasters in your state changed since 2020 through 2021? What kind of uh, adjustments uh, and lessons learned would you say that you've had? And I know that you're new, but you were there with us. So we'll go to you first, sir. Thanks, Persia. So I think um, I think the one that's already been said, I think one that um, certainly we've all felt is since 2020, really the shift of our workforce to that remote posture or a hybrid remote posture. Um, since 2020, we have had to respond to multiple hurricanes, a tropical storm, statewide civil unrest, multiple winter storms. Most recently, Mother Nature has blessed us with back-to-back -back winter storms, and we're looking down. Maybe maybe we'll do a, a, uh, a hat trick and, and have a third one this coming weekend, um, as well as cyber incidents. And just, I think the list continues. I think our ability and this workforce's ability to pivot quickly um, in the midst of a pandemic and be able to continue the work that they do responding to the pandemic um, continuing, uh, I think that really mission critical activity also while responding to other events that impact the state. Um, we have really been able to do it with 85 to 90% of our workforce at some parts of this, um, at, of this COVID arc, 85 to 90% of our workforce being remote. Um, and that is not something that our agency was certainly used to doing um, in the past. We very much are, you know, we flood the building with hundreds, almost a thousand people for some of our major events. And so having to do that very quickly, I think has certainly been our major adjustment and have, and have a lot of lessons learned on how to do that well and maybe how not to do that well uh, moving forward. I think a couple other things that I think have really been reinforced. I think um, the events that we've had to deal with since 2020 have really reinforced the dependencies of all of the functions and all of the events. And, and, and what I mean by that is obviously COVID is very much focused on a ESFA, public health and medical type of event, but the cascading impacts that we have seen from that event that we continue to deal with, whether it's supply chain, whether it's linkages to more traditional homeland security arena topics, such as misinformation, uh, threats on public officials leading to civil disturbance. Um, I think it has, it has really highlighted the dependencies that all of these events have. And I think our team particularly, you know, as a coastal, Atlantic coastal state, we are used to kind of putting head down, dealing with hurricanes, tropical weather, some of the more traditional events that we have. And I think overlaying, I think at one point we were in the midst of the COVID response, 
on the tail end of a tropical weather response, dealing with and ramping up civil disturbance during an election. And I think if we had all, if, if all of us had had an a, a exercise contractor come in with that scenario, you know, a couple of years ago, we would have laughed them out of the room. But I think what, what the last two years has shown is that these events, while we are used to dealing with them, I think in a singular focus of head down, dealing with the hurricane, the impacts from that and move on to the next, I think it has really reinforced that um, these events are becoming more and more dependent and interwoven. Um, and that um, there may be a primary event going on over here, but there are some secondary and follow on events here. And so our workforce has really had to, I think, um, while also managing the pivot to hybrid or pivot to remote work or virtual work, um, to also begin to navigate some of these interdependencies and, and linkages, particularly in the Homeland Security arena uh, for some of our events. And then I think lastly, um, you know, we have a huge benefit from Persia and some of the work that she has done linking our organization and the state emergency response team to elements of the private sector. And I think all of the events that we've gone through since 2020 has really reinforced the need that we need multiple avenues into those sectors, multiple avenues into those organizations. And one example would be, we have a very robust health and medical um, operational component that works with our hospital emergency managers on a day-to-day -day basis and our public health preparedness programs on a day-to-day -day basis. Persia has brought some linkages into those organizations from a different vantage point, from a different perspective and with different staff. And I think it has forced or caused some of those organizations internally to coordinate and work together more. If Persia is having conversations with one side, of, with leadership on one side of the organization and Another part of our agency is working with a, you know, a, a different part of that same organization. It has really, um, I think, improved our ability to work with those agencies. I think the other piece would be the avenues through our statewide associations. Um, so like many of you, I think wrapping our hands around some of the licensed care facility arena, long-term care facilities, I think is, can, be a, can be challenging. And through her work, we've really been able to expand the private sector to include some of our statewide associations, particularly for long-term care, licensed care, nursing facilities. And I've really been able to, to leverage better situational awareness, to leverage resources that that sector does bring to bear. Um, and so I think, again, it has just reinforced, we, we can no longer use a single point of entry into our traditional partners. Um, we've got to do it in a multifaceted way. And I'll stop Thank that you, one. sir. Right. Like those, uh, those cupcakes are coming, you know, in our BEOC cupcakes, that, that's the mode of commerce. But, and I want to swing over to uh, Director Tingle. Same question, sir. Thank you, Persia. And, and I want to build off of what Director Ray was talking about. I think all of us have seen uh, in the last couple of years, you know, the way in which we have to be dealing with multiple events concurrently um, and, and not not sequentially, not just, you know, um, you know, at different times of the year, we're, we're seeing our calendar change, we're seeing kind of risk profiles change, and a lot of that really get um, pushed on, on top of, of one another. And particularly when you come out of a significant event and your infrastructure is fragile, um, and you are um, still putting the pieces back together, so to speak, then you're more, more, more vulnerable to what the next event is going to cause and, and the impacts it's going to, to have. And, and your planning may be such that you're, you're anticipating, um, you know, dealing with that risk or dealing with that threat from a, uh, we're a completely whole, whereas what we've seen over the past couple of years um, are communities having to deal with these things not being completely whole, still being in a recovery process, still being in a fragile process. If you take the city of Lake Charles on the southwestern side of, of our state, for example, category four storm in August of 2020 and Hurricane Laura, Hurricane Delta, just really 45 days after made impact only 12 miles away in terms of where the eye made impact. And that was a very strong category two, if I recall. Then they had a winter weather event um, in February, so just several months later, um, all of those events knocked the power and water out for large areas of, of our state. And so you saw sort of these cascading impacts of seeing that same threat and that same impact having occurred again and again, and not the least of which was a, a flood that happened a few 
a few months later. And so really looking at sort of how do you help address and deal with um, these things that are all happening at the same time. And I remember, you know, talking to some survivors from a couple of these areas uh, and they're coming to FEMA with a stack of, of, of documentation and really just looking for help of how do we sort this into which event is this even related to and which, which, which event am I recovering from? Because really at the end of the day, it's all of them. You know what I mean? Like they're recovering from the cumulative impacts of it all. And from an operational standpoint, in terms of what we do at the state and what we do with our local and private partners, it's really trying to figure out how do we tear down some of those walls in which we sometimes categorize these things into uh, I'm only dealing with this or I'm only dealing with that and really cut across some of those lanes. And I, I think that's what Director Ray was talking about. We also have seen um, on the good side positive impacts from some of our resiliency investments in the past. And so, uh, you know, oftentimes when you hear the story of Hurricane Katrina that happened in New Orleans, you know, in 2005, and the impacts in the greater New Orleans area, you, you talk, we talk about the levees failing, and we talk about, you know, the, the fact that that some of that infrastructure was not what it needed to be and not in the shape that it needed to be to uh, address that risk profile. And what we saw with Hurricane Ida earlier um, in August of 2021 um, was that the new investments in that infrastructure and the new investments in that protection uh, largely spared that part of our state from any impacts from hurricane uh, surge. And so uh, the investments from a taxpayer perspective, the investments in, in, in creativity from an engineering perspective, and just all of the different ways in which partners have played a part in, in not just putting that system back together, but making it better, having it be forward focused in terms of what risk profiles would, we would face in the future. We've seen the direct uh, benefit of that from losses that were avoided and, and, and lives that were saved and uh, you know, investments that are um, able to be, you know, uh, realized because that protection uh, paid off. And so that's kind of a hidden story a little bit sometimes with, with the recent hurricanes that we've had is, is that there have been investments that have been made. His the, the, the hurricane risk reduction system around Greater New Orleans is the biggest example of that. But we've seen a number of examples where parishes, in our case, counties for, I guess, everybody else, um, have, have taxed themselves and have made their own investments in coastal protection. And so we've seen the benefit of those coastal investments um, in reducing the, the damages from, from storm surge. And so um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great story that we're happy to tell of, of that we're not there yet by any means, but in terms of looking forward and making some of those investments, we've seen them uh, pay off. The other thing that I would say is that it's just reminded us kind of how interdependent all of this is. Um, when we were talking earlier, you know, we've had we had some um, critical infrastructure that had made investments in in terms of resiliency and and being able to uh, maintain you know emergency power or temporary power. They had made their own investments, purchased their own generators and and fuel tanks, and done all of those things. But their, their planning wasn't for the power being out for a week or two weeks or, or three weeks. It was, you know, the planning factors and some of the planning uh, needed to be bumped up. And so when, when uh, you know, they were able to maintain those emergency operations uh, for some period of time, once it became clear that they were going to run out of fuel and we had an overall shortage of fuel and, and all of the impacts to the refining capacity and, and the distribution system for that, for that fuel was having those cascading effects, um, we began to hear from partners that we don't usually hear from in the state EOC because their own resiliency planning and their own capacity to kind of bridge some of those gaps have begun to run short. Um, and it created an opportunity, an opportunity for then and an opportunity for the future to better, uh, you know, realize those partnerships and better plan for, you know, what is a reasonable thing to, 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 to you know, a time period to be ready to be out. Um, and what we saw was from a winter weather perspective, from the storm perspective, is these large scale power outages, not just distribution, but generation, uh, large scale 
water system outages and impacts um, have a real cascading impact, not just on uh, what we do in terms of disaster response, uh, but also what the community is able to do in terms of recovery and restoration um, and the amount of resources that that takes. And I, and I just think thinking in terms of an environment where you're having to deal with more than one thing at a time uh, is the new reality that, that we're facing, um, even if it's just two hurricanes at the same time. There was a, a period in 2020 when Hurricane Laura was spinning up uh, that Hurricane Marco was, they were almost, the paths were almost, you know, uh, crossing right off of our coastline. And so we saw ourselves having to deal with two storms at the very same time, and we're not a very, you know, large state. And so I think the, the complexities that come with having to deal with these events all at the same time, I think COVID has underlined that. And the way in which these inter interdependencies play, and when we see something go down somewhere, thinking about all of the cascading effects of that is something that we've had to spend a lot of time talking about. You, you know, Director Tingle, um, uh, your comments make me wonder um, how well we're maybe including our assessment, uh, our thyroid assessments to include those potential cascading impacts. Might be something that, some adjustment that we need to make later. And I can go off on a tangent, but I'm, I'm going to Director Hastings in Alabama next. So I'm going to hold that. Out. I'm going I'm to park that. Uh, if, Laura, if you'll make a note of that, I, I, I'm going to circle back on my own personally regarding that threat assessment. Oh, the thyra. Oh, the thyra. Hey, real quickly, I'm going to, you got to hurt the cats here, Persa. So help me with my ADHD. I didn't take my medicine this morning, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce around here real quickly. So this is great. So let me ask you to turn yourself up just a little bit before you go on. When you say turn myself up, are you saying my volume? Can you hear me now? I can hear you, but I'd, I'd love, to, I, I want you booming. I want you in stereo, oh, sir. I will try to talk real loud. Um, and let now you're muted. This is the best microphone I have. Perfect. Okay. okay, we'll we'll take you we'll take you with a loud and boisterous. You know. I'm going to yell at you, Persia. Okay. So the first thing is uh, Kyle Oberly. He's from Maryland. Uh, he resigned and now he works for Deloitte. He's traveling around. Uh, his wife's a traveling nurse, so they're making big bucks going to all the locations in the coastal communities. But he wrote this really nice article: domestic preparedness, uh, resilience, the evolving status of emergency management organization. It goes back to what Will was talking about. And here's a quick excerpt. Until recently, many officials, public administrators, and even citizens were unfamiliar with the services that emergency managers provide. Until this past year, emergency managers have sometimes been referred to as the hurricane people who are thankfully there when something bad happens. My wife calls me the weatherman. Although this is the past perception, I would argue it's probably the present in some cases, the reality is that modern emergency management agencies are highly sophisticated organizations that combine the collective talents of multidisciplinary staff to solve complex problems. They're also forward thinking, trying to create ways to augment government missions rather than taxing them, because taxing them would be an additional stressor for social and economic resilience, and we can't say tax in Alabama during election year. All right, so that I wanted to go there, and now I'm gonna transition real quickly to a tweet that just went out uh, going back to Casey. So six months after Ida, to the people out there, uh, Grand Isle just got their power back, just got their water advisory lifted, and they're starting to move back to those coastal regions of Louisiana. So are you prepared? Are we prepared? And if you're waiting for the federal government and the state to be your response agency, you're wrong. It's it's not a great it's not a great uh, plan. And I just want I'm going to say that because I'll talk about the confusion we have in the framework that we talk about in the federal government. So the question is uh, what has changed in 2020? And uh, what I would say is that, you know, COVID has impacted all lives, not only emergency and disaster response, but just how we do business everywhere. Everyone's expectations of day-to-day -day experiences have changed in many ways from the life before COVID and now this post-COVID. And there are so many of us that wanted to just go back to normal, but I just wanted to go forward to better. Um, so I used to think that COVID was an accelerant or a change agent, but I'm afraid that the inertia of bureaucracies and, and hierarchies and, and humans is going to regress us back to the norm and make us snap back. So where I was hoping for some plastic deformation in the system, 
I'm fearful that we're just going to go back to what we did in 2020. And I think we can move forward to a lot better. So that's just me thinking out loud. In emergency management, we're, we are adapting and using virtual uh, meeting technology like most other agencies uh, in, in private industry and also in state government. I refer to this as kind of like a hybrid emergency operations center model where we have a small cadre of emergency management professionals and our emergency management coordinator personnel on the state EOC floor who are logged into web EOC and they're kind of in close coordination and, and what I call the choke con where you, you're, you're with people in human human interaction. And then we use MS Teams to coordinate with our emergency support function members. And that's a wide net. And it actually allows us to coordinate, collaborate with more people at any time of the day. And those, those meeting areas are always open. So it, at the same time, we're expanding our coordination collaboration beyond the borders of our state EOC in the middle of Alabama in Clinton, Chilton County. Um, it makes some things harder, which is that human to human interaction and relationship building and uh, maintaining those relationships. Because I'm a human person. I love meeting people, greeting people, shaking hands. And that's been a little bit challenging recently. And relationships are the backbone of everything we do in emergency management. But the, the other consequences of COVID 19, how we do stuff, is just connecting with disaster survivors with human services. And in addition to all those problems that people are facing today, it's just, it's more difficult for us to interact and deliver those services when we're trying to do it virtually. It's just, it's, it's not quite the same. Where FEMA has transitioned a lot of their activities to virtual and it works okay because they have distributed centers that coordinate paperwork and administration. Um, it does add to the confusion of our citizens and maybe even some of you and sometimes myself as we go out. We had a disaster, October 7th, flooding disaster. It was two and a half months before we got a presidential declaration. And inside of that two and a half months, everyone's asking, when's FEMA going to come? When's FEMA going to come? When's FEMA going to be here? And it's hard to tell them FEMA never comes. They don't really come. They may be there, some of them. But under our framework, and you have to remind people this all the time, it's federally supported, state managed, locally executed. So the people that are coming are you your neighbors, and in this case in Alabama, the disaster was over and cleaned up by BOAD, volunteers acted in, dis in disasters and private sector partners in the community. And that's what emergency management is about, is solving your own problems. And then on the backside, maybe the federal government and state will help you out. So just some food for thought and some observations from Alabama. No, thank you for that, sir. And, and before before I go to, to Director Thomas, I um, want you to define for the group just don't want to leave anybody out. What do you mean when you talk about choke con? Oh, yes. Um, that's an Army term I learned when I was in the Air Force that I don't like. That a lot of Army leaders want to be so close to you that they can choke you to make you do something. So that's just a term of endearment that I, uh, endearment that I used with, Ray, or with uh, Persia. Thank you, Persia. Yes, sir. Just make sure everybody's tracking. Director Thomas, same question for you, sir. Hey, Persia, thank you. And I will tell you, going last from uh, behind three great directors is a little bit of a challenge because uh, Will, Casey, and Brian hit, hit pretty much all of the things that we're all dealing with. But I will tell you, there, there is another part that uh, is a little different that uh, I will bring up that kind of is changing the way most of us do business, probably 34, 35 states from the last research we did. So Everyone is right that we did things during COVID, during 2020, that none of us thought we would do. We coordinated with other agencies more than we ever have. We've, that's all we, we've always been a collaborative agency. In our particular case, we had to teach other agencies how to be collaborative because it just wasn't in their DNA. And that was a lot of what we did. And, and it took us a while to get there, in all honesty. <clears throat> but the, the more we got there, the better the, uh, the response went. I think everyone will agree with that. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, most, most states are set up in their constitution so that there's a lot of immediate power that's given to the governor during emergencies, right? And there's a lot of immediate uh, actions that emergency management agencies can take because they're necessary. They are necessary to be able to save lives and, and to protect folks and property. What happened during COVID in a lot of states is that that authority got used for mitigation efforts. And Pick, pick your, your politics, right? Either uh, 
you're a purist and in, in medical and in medical background, or you just believe that there was no there was no COVID. I mean, you know, it's from one end to the other. But it was a lot of the state's emergency disaster agencies that were the the instrument of a lot of those mitigation efforts because that's just where the authority law lied within that state. And I, I there's about 34, 35 states since then that have had legislation introduced to limit that power and limit that power because of uh, feelings about how it was used during COVID. Uh, I really believe that, and Pennsylvania was one of them, and ours, and as a matter of fact, it was a constitutional amendment that uh, precluded the governor from issuing a disaster deck for more than 21 days. A little challenging, all of us know we have 30 days to decide if we, we reach the level of a federal disaster, so it kind of short circuits that. Uh, but the most the troubling one is you can never issue another disaster deck for that same thing. But I think what we found most challenging, and we don't know the results of this yet, is also gave the legislature the authority to decide to decide what five types of disasters are. One of them they're, they're calling a military disaster. I have no idea what that is, and that, that's kind of challenging. But the legislature, by constitutional amendment, will decide how those disasters are managed. Uh, and 34 other states, I believe, had similar legislation passed. I don't think any of us on this call know what the end result of that's going to be. And I think that that, that that began in 2020. The changes are yet to be seen. But I think that that is something that every one of us will have to deal with as, as time goes on one way or another. I'm confident that we will. I am confident that everybody in government really wants to help their residents when they're in need. And I think that that's going to prevail uh, as in the day. But I think that there'll be challenges going forward for all of us as we work through that new complexity to what is already a very complex uh, situation. So that, that I think is a change that happened that I think we're going to see in the future. Thank you for that, sir. And I'm going to ping pong it right back to you with my second question at the top, top of them, at the top of the arc right now. And uh, here's my question. Um, talk to me about, in Pennsylvania, any changes to your private sector program uh, that you have had? And I want you to include any uh, innovations, uh, challenges, uh, even if these have to do with the framework of your program or staff. And um, <clears throat> um, do you see any opportunities that uh, might now emerge for the private sector to assist government and vice versa in support of communities? What's new? Well, thank you for that. Uh, that is a much easier question to answer being first than being last. I will just, I just want to point that out. So, Will, I'm sorry. <laughs> but so we have had a, uh, uh, an on again, off again relationship with the private sector in Pennsylvania uh, going back for a lot of years. I will tell you that probably the last five years it's been on again and it stayed that way. Uh, one of the, way, the reasons that we did that is because we took some lessons learned and we took some failures and try to take some lessons from them. Uh, Fleet Response Working Group, which some of the folks on this, on this call, I'm sure you're very familiar with, has been around a long time. Uh, it is a mixture of private and public sector uh, to really accomplish tremendous things of moving the, the, the electric utilities up and down the coast that we all, we all need to have happen. The reason that works is because it is a, a group that is formed and, and managed by the private sector with government at the table. So that's one of the things we did in Pennsylvania is we took a different approach. We have our problem, our private sector, our BEOC has a group called the Endeavor Group. Uh, and, and we started this off and we put some effort into it. The first meeting we had with the private sector was in the governor's residence. We really wanted folks to understand this is a top down approach. The governor that, that really supports us from there. We, we tell the joke of uh, we invited private sector to a birthday party and then told them that uh, they were in charge. So <laughs> it kind of became kind of like that. But we walked out of there and, and I'll tell you, Tom and, his, and his, his friends helped us with this. We walked out of there with private sector folks step, stepping to the table. They were in charge of it. We have developed it ever since then. And right now it is probably, I think, just a phenomenal uh, organization that just keeps getting big, better. And I'll give you a couple of examples. One is, uh, and some of you have heard me talk about this, 
we were really good at getting people stuck on Pennsylvania roads in the wintertime. We, we, we were really darn good at that. Right? We've made the national news more times than I want to talk about for doing that. And so we also, so we said, we need to do something about that. <laughs> we just have to change that. So we talked to the private sector. And we learned some things, and, and I have some data here from a little, the survey's a little dated now, but it really drove home to us how important it is to try to help the private sector keep moving during winter, during weather-related delays. So about 25% of the non-recurring delays in shipping across the nation are for weather-related. And the congestion costs, the costs for that and just the 85 uh, top urban areas in the country back in, this is 15 or 16 done by uh, Texas A&M, was about $9.5 billion a year. And then when you add into that the product productivity loss for weather-related delays, it comes up to another $3.4 billion a year. So, and in our case, what we found was not just the commercial traffic, but the residents that were stuck in those queues, because you get commercial traffic stuck, it's really hard to move them again. For a day, we had folks that, that passed away. We had folks that had a medical emergency. We had babies born in the queue. Uh, so we knew we needed to do better. And we worked with the private sector. We come up with a, we started out with a road closure protocol. So how do we take care of people after we get them stuck? Took us about a year to realize that was probably not the smartest thing we ever did. And we worked with the private sector through that a lot of different uh, we, we had stuff staged at the highways. We were able to get nourishment out to folks. We, we actually won national awards for an alerting system. So we uh, worked with 501 Connect. And uh, when you're stuck, we actually uh, geocode that, that area. We send a wireless alert to you. You sign up and you get text messages and we you know what's going on in terms of, of uh, the trap queue and how we get people out of it. So we, we won awards for that technology. But working with the private sector saying, it really wasn't helping. What we wanted to do was not get people stuck in the first place, right? We wanted to keep the traffic moving, right? So we worked with them and we come up with the road, the road restriction and ban framework over a couple of years. And what this does is it puts in different tiers of restrictions based on weather, and again, working with private sector, under, helping them understand the different capabilities of the different equipment during the different weather conditions, and then working with us to understand what our concerns are, how fast we can move snow, how, you know, what the cycle times are. And that over the years has progressed. And I give you the, the last storm we had, I look at the notes here, it was January 16th, a lot of weather. There were 127 different travel bans that went on. So different roads, different bands. We coordinate with the contiguous states so that we don't have folks go into Pennsylvania and stop because we have a restriction someone else doesn't. When we started this, we did nothing but answer phone calls and quite frankly, get yelled at an awful lot by every trucking company in the world, every trucking company that, that will goes through Pennsylvania. 127 different restrictions. We had one complaint. And that is over a couple of years of working directly with the private sector and really coordinating with them about what worked for them and what worked for us. I think the most amazing thing was we actually adjusted our policy based on some of their feedback and they'd never seen that before. They'd never really seen a government entity. Uh, this is, and this just isn't a, a Pennsylvania emergency management policy. It's a Commonwealth policy. It's a state police, it's a transportation, it's a turnpike commission, it's us. We do all the coordination, we're a big piece of it but it is multi-government agencies that adjusted a policy and a framework based on uh, response from a private sector. The other thing is that I really want to touch on is during the Colonial Pipeline uh, cyber attack, uh, we were able to bring together with through the PBEOC representatives that took care of the, the industry from the ports to the pumps and coordinate that group together along with the, uh, the appropriate state agencies to really get a good idea of what was going on and to see the briefings go between and, and kind of that guard put down by the by, uh, private sector, as well as some of the government entities to kind of talk openly about, hey, how bad can this get? What should we really be planning? We really need the real story here. It was nice to see that happen. And that, that happens because we've been at this for five or six years now and we've developed those relationships. Uh, so I am going to stop and let the others have uh, their say and not try to keep going because you're right, you could talk for hours about this. So that's pretty much kind of how we've developed and how we have really 
I'm really proud of the work that our team has done in this and really proud of the private sector and the Endeavor Group for stepping to the table and really running this as a private organization with government at the table. Hey, thanks, Director Thomas. I, I um, really, at RBUC, we amplified a lot of you guys' uh, messages from Endeavor uh, this past snowstorm, just because the <clears throat> those storms kind of linked. We got a bit of it and then you, so we were able to, to really use our uh, our partnership between states to amplify your messages and you to ours. It was it, it was it was it was great working with with your team at that point. And we're shooting Alabama for the same question, sir. Well, I, just, I want to make note that Pennsylvania said that the government actually listened. So that's impressive because usually I say that I'm you know I'm part of the problem. I'm part of the hierarchy. I, I'm, a, I'm a government guy, and I'm trying. I need to get better every day. So um, Alabama's uh, not as far forward with a business operations center as some of our other contemporaries are, but we are a diverse state, very rural, some urban areas, um, and our business and industry across the state are primarily, uh, primarily engaged in emergency management through strong partners with kind of our, our local emergency management offices. So we keep on uh, putting an emphasis on our local county EMAs, and we don't have many city EMA directors, it's mostly counties working closely with local leaders, the Chamber of Commerce, their Kiwanis, Rotary Clubs to establish those uh, relationships, grassroots, uh, casting the wet, uh, the net uh, wide, and then bringing those people. Uh, and it's, it's really important at that local level since 70% of our economy is local businesses. And I think we could all say that sometimes those small local businesses are also the least resilient when there's a uh, a, a large perturbation to the system, like a, a major disaster or a huge um, event that really sucks your, your resources and your struggle, and you're not associated with a large corporation. Uh, at the state level, uh, EMA, we've adopted a distributed approach to the private sector relationships. We understand that each one of our individuals brings some relationships with them, and we want to make sure it, we're, we're careful to not put that into a box uh, in a hierarchical chart or an individual because then you're one to make none. But we still need to make that mechanism so that we can leverage through that to a business operations center to the private sector uh, to make them a part of the recovery. Because we know that if the money's not flowing, the recovery's not going and the economy's not growing. So um, we're a very small organization. We can't do it alone. So we, we want to make sure that we're partnering with those people. Because again, going back to what I said at the beginning, the government doesn't do a lot of things well. Um, we're working to establish a private sector relationship coordinator at the state level. Um, but right now our managers are a little tight, our budgets are not great, and it is really hard to hire people in um, Alabama, especially in, in Clinton. But that person we envision will be more of like an orchestra conductor as opposed to uh, directing. It's going to be cultivating relationships and allowing the private sector to organize themselves and then just have a conduit from information from the state to them in the county plugging them in to local where uh, they need assistance and then a, a feedback mechanism to see what we can do better on the backside. So um, we're gonna make sure that we continue to cultivate those things and, and follow that framework of federally supported, state managed, but locally executed and really do what we can to make sure that our local EMA directors are successful, have those partnerships and where we have them and they don't, then we'll, we'll fill those gaps with those uh, partnerships to make sure they don't fail. So that's a little bit about Alabama right now. We're still building. Oh, <clears throat> thank you for that, sir. And, and you know, I'm standing by to help you support that person that you bring in and, uh, you know, rough them up. And, you know, I, I can do that for you. Uh, and I want to go to Louisiana. Same question, Director Tingle. Thank you. So <clears throat> I'll just say to start um, that this is an area that just needs continuous improvement, right? There are just so many ways in which um, there are connections and partnerships that need to be built and um, sort of nourished and supported. And, you know, much more in our state needs to happen. Um, and, and I think we're starting to recognize the way in which this is a two-way street, both from an information sharing and from a, a, a support and resource perspective. And it's not it's not working separately all the time, and it's not just pushing, um, but it's also gathering, um, you know, information and resources and, and expertise. Um, so I just would start there that that we need we need more resources here, we need more emphasis here, um, 
and uh, we need to continue to develop those partnerships and strengthen those partnerships. Uh, I will say that I think we've seen a number of instances, particularly over the last um, two years in which these partnerships have come to bear uh, and have benefited our state. We, uh, I, I think Director Ray mentioned this earlier. So when the presidential election was happening, the federal election was happening in, in the fall of 2020, um, Hurricane Zeta had just made landfall and had um, caused some significant power outages in the New Orleans area. So the very, the most populated part of our state was experiencing power outages in the environment where there's all of this noise and all of this concern and, and all of this information and misinformation about a, a federal election. And so we were all very much concerned that these, these things would sort of, uh, for us, begin to kind of um, snowball a little bit. And, and, and we wanted to be very clear about our ability to uh, you know, safely and appropriately execute elections in a time of great recovery and in, and in the consideration of Hurricane Zeta in a time where actual response was still, um, was still happening. And so a great deal of effort to find uh, alternate voting locations and to message that. But I, I wanna give a shout out to one of our main um, power providers that is, we were looking at temporary power solutions to try to ensure that we had, if not uh, mostly backup power, but in some cases, primary power, um, you know, from a, from a generator perspective, provided to our, our clerk of courts and our registrar of voters and all of the infrastructure that has to go on to support an election. We, we work with our partners to really identify the key facilities and locations that had to have that power restoration and where it couldn't be restored um, to figure out what the backup plan was so that we were not trying to message um, a whole series of location changes in a very tight window in an environment where you already had some lack of trust and, and concern about the, you know, what, what all was happening with the election. And I'll just say that that partnership uh, fortunately came off flawless, that we were um, you know, that the private sector provided generators to a number of those locations, uh, ensured that they were operational, ensured that they were supported in a way that had been very difficult for us to get to that many places in that period of time. And then we took sort of ownership of the larger facilities and kind of the state managed backbone of what all, you know, needed to happen in terms of, so I think the election in 2020 uh, for us was a real success story in terms of some of those partnerships and identifying the resources and the plan in a very short period of time uh, to where we were able to execute an election in very, uh, you know, difficult time of both response and recovery uh, with, with the workers for the polls, for example, some of them living in temporary housing because we needed to move them into areas uh, that had been recently impacted. And so all of that just showed, you know, great partnership and, and some real success stories uh, that went along with that. A second example would be, so we have had a, a number of opportunities for our public to take resilient measures into their own hands and purchase, um, you know, standby generators for their homes and, and portable generators to, uh, you know, kind of sustain critical operations for their homes. And in one of our most impacted areas for Hurricane Ida, what we saw was that when the power went out and the immediate drain on the, on the uh, natural gas grid, because all of those standby generators began to light up at the same time, it, it highlighted for us that even in, in cases where we were taking steps to be more resilient, we weren't necessarily thinking through all of the ways in which those uh, were dependent upon other things uh, to continue to run. And we would see lines at, at, at the, uh, you know, at the, at the small number of fuel stations and gas stations that were open, not for vehicles per se, but for fuel for generators and the, the fuel to keep generators running and the way in which that fuel grid is so interdependent upon a number of things, not the least of which was um, power outages to 
refineries and power generation outages at refineries that were in our own state impacted by the very same event were causing some of the problems down the street in terms of uh, lines at gas stations and how all of that worked. And I think what we came up with were some uh, certainly not 100% uh, solutions there, but some ways in which we could support um, with either resources or information, some of those key partners and receive key information from those partners in terms of how do we prioritize in an environment where we've got limited resources? Where are we going to address first? Um, if we've got emergency power that we can provide at the state level or with our federal partners, where are we going to apply that and to try to do it in a systemic uh, approach as opposed to just you know, whoever's screaming the loudest or wherever uh, someone may think the need is. And really from a perspective of, okay, where do we begin to turn on the distribution of some of these things and then work our way down to where it actually has an interface to the public. And so we saw a lot of that with both fuel and water. Um, in the winter event, we were supplying bulk water to a number of our tier one hospitals and, and emergency um, departments. And what they began to tell us was the patients that we're seeing are all coming in for dialysis. If you could get, if you could get somehow water restored to these key dialysis centers, um, it would lessen our need for, for water and it would, it would reduce the demand that we're seeing in our emergency rooms. And so that caused us to go back to the drawing board and figure out, okay, let's prioritize those dialysis centers which ones have the biggest footprint, which ones are located in the right areas um, and begin to push some of our bulk water missions to them so that that was then overall uh, reducing the demand on the medical system and putting our hospitals in a better position to be able to respond to the, to the serious needs that were coming. Um, but, it, it, but from a staffing perspective with limited staff and accessibility of staff and you know, in a post event environment, prioritizing those resources and having the right partners in the community to help us as sort of the, the decision makers know where those resources need to be prioritized. And so drawing upon their uh, expertise and their experience and really having trusted partners that are willing to say, no, that entity across the street needs it first because they can help me if you can get them turned on first. And so having that, that environment of trust and to know that we're not playing favorites and not picking you know, winners and losers, but we're really trying to do it from an organized and emergent in using our emergency management tools um, and then using the expertise that our private sector has, both in terms of which resources and how those resources can be applied and in prioritizing those resources were things that we saw as, as lessons learned um, and, and things that we want to build on in the future. You, you, know, you know, Director Tina, there's so much in there. There was so much in there. But, but, but I, I did notice that there, that means there's still a plug there for us to really consider um, some of these cascading effects, even cascading events of our solutions and to, to add those into our planning considerations um, you know, moving forward and, and I think inclusion to our, our threat assessments. So uh, I'm gonna go to Director Ray, but it's so much there. I'm, I'm, I've got questions, I can feel them coming. Director Ray, sir, to you. Persia. So I think just continue to foot stomp. I mean, I think partnership is gonna be key and it's gotta be one that is, that is approached in a collaborative nature. Um, I think I can honestly say that every event um, that we have done over the last couple of years um, has involved the private sector as we look at a successful response, regardless of the type. I mean, certainly our major recent storm of record in Hurricane Florence, um, we as the state emergency response team could not have done what we did without the private sector, I mean, hands down. But I think moving forward, some of our um, maybe uh, lower level type incidents or, uh, or kind of non-traditional events, I think the the private sector has been a critical part of that response, even if it's nothing more than information sharing and situational awareness of resources that are available or not. Um, I think it's that that partnership is going to be key moving forward. And I think as, as some of the other panelists have said, it, it cannot be us coming with the solution. 
it has to be engaging the private sector to collaboratively develop what those solutions are gonna be for the problem set. I think, um, you know, I think we have a, a, a really robust structure in place that we're obviously incredibly proud of. Um, I think there will be a lot of expansion there as we look at trying to get to different sectors than, than maybe what we currently have, try to, to continue to diversify some of our membership in our, in our BEOC. But I do think from, a, um, from an innovation or a change, I, I think we still have some work to do on our side when it comes to fighting a little bit of the traditional mindset of, no, no, that, that's the private sector. Um, you know, they need to stay over there or, you know, we, we can't support them because that's, they're, a, they're a private sector entity. I think we've seen a lot of improvement and a lot of, um, I think, minds shift and change over the last several years about no, that the, the private sector has got to be not just a part of the response, but it's also going to be critical to that community recovering well and being more resilient. We have to be able to help support those pieces of the infrastructure to stand back up. I've seen the differing numbers, but I think we've all seen it. The percentage in this country of critical infrastructure that is privately owned, they have to be at the table, right? We have to be able to support the recovery of those critical infrastructure private sector partners to make sure that our individual North Carolinians and those communities are protected, are able to stand back up and recover, and are able to do it in a way you know, moving forward that minimizes the impacts of, of future events. They have to be at the table. And so I think our real evolution or shift is going to be the linkage of our homeland security section, our homeland security apparatus in the state, particularly from a critical infrastructure protection standpoint, and how we are, again, I think leveraging the existing partnerships that are there and maybe deepening some of those as well. Um, I think Persia has done an incredible job and, and, and her staff team um, to build some inroads into some of these organizations and, and major corporations here or major uh, partners here in the state. And I think there's some additional pieces and support we can give them from different parts of the organization. And so I think continuing to improve how we're linking the dots and doing all of that internally, um, I think is going to be critical. Sir, it sounds like you are, you're rolling into my, my last, my third question, uh, which had to do with, um, uh, you know, the way forward. So expansion is what I think I heard you say. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to get some um, some other buzzwords here. I'm going to go first backwards here. You're saying expansion, sir. Uh, you said that, uh, you know, expanding in other areas, uh, focusing on smaller events with uh, private sector support and recovery in other areas that will be preparedness mitigation. And I'm going to swing back to uh, uh, Director Tingle and, and ask him the way forward, sir. Give me some thoughts on that. In our um, your outlook uh, in this, what, what I consider is still emerging area of emergency management, the way forward, private and public partnership engagement together. Sure. So <clears throat> I, I think it, first of all, you, you need a sense of trust, I think, to really be the foundation for um, what those partnerships and relationships are um, if if there's a sense and 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 I think you know Mr. Thomas was right earlier when he said that that some of this is more political now than it's than it's ever been. We we um, you know traditionally always got kudos for you know all of the hard work and and, and even in this most recent uh, event we saw political type questions in terms of why this and not this and, 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 and questions that just were different than what we'd seen in the past. And I think there's a political tinge to some of that stuff. Um, and, and what we try to do, I, I think I speak for everybody here, um, is, you know, in terms of emergency management, is it's, it's trying to deal with the facts that we have and not prioritize based upon anything other than what we think are really solid criteria for what makes sense from an emergency management perspective, what's going to save lives, what's going to save property, you know, really working it from that top down um, approach. And so um, you have to have a, an element of trust, I think, to, to really support those relationships and those partnerships. Um, 
and I think the other the other thing that I would say in, in terms of what we're learning and, and where we think we're going to go from here um, is you never know all of the partners that you're going to need. Um, and so tapping in into the associations. We've seen some, some great success um, in working with our hotel association, for example, on, on sheltering in situations where we never really looked at hotels as a, as a shelter you know, uh, approach. And we certainly never looked at going into a place like New Orleans as a shelter location. And so what we've seen is some, some you know, just some creativity around okay, here is the problem. Before we go completely into the bunker trying to solve the problem, who are the other partners that we need to bring in that either because of their everyday expertise or their everyday resources or roles can help, can help solve those problems? Um, and we've seen the role of some of these associations to really give us some force, force multipliers so that we're not spending all of our time trying to track down a lot of members um, but really tap into it and let the association do some of that heavy lifting for us in terms of taking the questions back and coming back with, with proposed answers. So, so those are some of the things. Um, I think, think what we have seen over the past couple of years and maybe what we'll see moving forward is the private sector coming to us for assistance in ways that perhaps they never thought they would necessarily need assistance, that, that, that they had kind of you know, designed a plan and an approach that had them being self-sufficient. But when they can't find housing for their workforce because their, their workers' housing has been destroyed or their workers are displaced and they're coming to us saying, well, what programs exist you know, to help get people um, back home and back to their communities and back to their jobs? Um, you know, they're realizing that there are ways in which we can work together, you know, on the on the personal side of things that that will help them from a workforce perspective. When it's looking at restoration timelines and reentry programs and and things that that are about how are we going to prioritize what gets turned on and what gets opened up and how is all of that going to work, that those partnerships are key and being able to to also give the information for why something else is not happening um, helps support that element of trust that we've not just written, you know, this entity off or this sector off, or the, but that it's really, there is a, a method to how some of these decisions are being made. And, and I think um, what we have always had as it relates to the petrochemical industry, for example, in that sector, um, is a great partnership with emergency management because there's just already a lot of, uh, of uh, overlap in, in ways in which you know, those entities are, are supporting us and we're supporting them. And now we're seeing, okay, let's get into the other, uh, the other critical sectors in our economy and where this is going. Um, and how do we create trust? How do we create relationships? And how do we provide and get information that's helpful to decision makers, whether the decision makers are on our side of the fence or on their side of the uh, their side of the fence? And in terms of where things are happening, we've seen some, you know, just some some simple dashboard type tools that provide some situational awareness and all of us, you know, kind of having a a common operating picture around what is in fact open or what is in fact closed and where something's coming next. And being able to utilize associations to help to help you know expand that message and get it to the right people and and salt and save us some of the legwork uh, in a in an environment where we've got kind of limited resources there have been helpful and hopefully are things that we'll build on moving forward. So sir, so on my so on my list here, I'll make sure that I understand. I've got trust expansion. Director Ray was talking about into other sectors, focus on smaller events. Uh, expanding private sector role, so into response, into mitigation, into recovery, or even further into recovery. Um, and uh, I'm going to add one before I, I go to uh, Director Hastings, and that is that maybe on the recovery side, we need to expand how we think in government about what private sector can do in recovery, because this task force staffing workforce issues we're having now, I don't see any reason why we can't invite private sector I, and my, my boss is hearing this now, my, my, my next little idea here, 
so that we can invite private sector perhaps into some of these joint task force like our workforce group. I think they would really probably like to be involved in that at this stage, especially when we're talking about recovery for displaced workers. So I'm gonna add that to our list and go to Director Hastings, Alabama. Way forward, sir. Hey, I was gonna say uh, Institute of, uh, Institutions of Higher Education and in Alabama for sure, since we have a ton of HBCUs, getting those young energetic graduates into the emergency management community because we teach connectedness, interconnectedness and problem solving under very uh, adverse conditions. So 2021 was a rough year for Alabama. 2020 was eight uh, presidential major disaster declarations. I like to say that we had 2020 and then 2021 was really 2021 again. And then here we are in 2022, which feels like 2020 too. Um, it's, it's all two years of COVID fog and we've had some challenges, but I think we've also seen through that fog to where we need to go in the future. Our outlook is always optimistic, and I am an optimist. We're retooling our approach across uh, our board. Uh, we're emphasizing the importance of community resilience, building partnerships. Right now, we're, we've got a plan. Uh, we're on our second resilience summit. We started in Montgomery. We're going to Birmingham. We're going up to Huntsville, then it's down to the coast. And we're trying to bring in uh, counties, local officials, legislators, private sector, faith based organizations into this like minded council that we're hoping to get the governor's support on and, and really kind of talk about this, this resilience effort and what it means. Um, and collecting those partners that want to be a part of the mitigation and the, the uh, preparedness on the front side to minimize the effects on the back side, because this is about the economy and the economic nexus of uh, disasters. They're, they crush us, they're expensive. And we, we, tr we spend so much time trying to hide the cost, but I wish we'd talk about it so we don't subsidize them and we invest on the front side to minimize those uh, costs on the back side. So, you know, all disasters have an economic impact. There's a lot of opportunity for us to build these stronger relationships. And it should be with our economic de uh, development partners, our community planners, and the private sector uh, from a systems perspective of making our community, uh, communities more resilient. Because preparedness is good business. Um, you've heard me say this, Persia, and anyone who's been on the AHC kind of circuit before. Prepared employees are present employees. And Casey, you were talking about prepared employers employ prepared employees. It is good for disaster resilience and the economy. So this makes business sense. But now we got to get that buy-in because if businesses shut down, they lose money. But if their their folks are in resilient homes, fortified homes, we have building codes, and they just dust off the vegetated debris or the floodwaters recede and they're still in their home safe, then they just hop in their car and they go to work because their buildings and the, the businesses are also resilient. So this is a system that if we, if we look past just internally of just making a dollar, but how do we make dollars over the long term? I think we could probably sell this a little better, but right now it's just it's very, very challenging. Um, and I'm hoping we're just gonna keep beating that drum and happy persistence, we'll, we'll get across this and build a bunch of resilient soldiers across Alabama. So thanks, Berger, for this opportunity. No, 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 I, I got you. So we are investing in preparedness. Um, preparedness is mitigation, right? And economic development. Because we have to remember, I think sometimes too, that our businesses are people and those people are communities. The communities are our families. I mean, it kind of goes into that whole community approach. And, um, and I want to hear what the, thank you for that, sir. And Director Thomas, the way forward, sir. I think uh, a lot of the other directors hit the way forward. I think uh, it's a couple of different pieces. One is internally. I think that the emergency management profession has really changed over the last 10 years. Uh, Pennsylvania, we're a civil service state, right? So it is a lot of rules and, and uh, it's changing a cruise ship, not a speedboat. But uh, I think we've done a lot to that. And I think we have to do that. I said, and when we wrote our classification specs, there were no degrees in emergency management. They didn't exist. They were folks like, like me that came from one, one part of uh, public service and somehow ended up in this thing called emergency management. It's a profession now, there are degrees. So we are working hard, we're bringing interns in, we're having uh, a much better career ladder for emergency management specialists. So they don't just come in and stay here till they're gone because we need to keep them, right? That we, we need to keep people. So I think building that internal 
workforce uh, that we all need to build for this profession is important because that's a building block for everything. Then I think uh, the other directors hit the nail on the head. We, it really is about resilience. We've talked about response for a whole lot of times and touched about preparedness a little bit. You put them all together, you really have resilience. And I really think that that is the, the, the key to us being uh, more, more resilient as a, as a nation, in all honesty, right? We, we really need to have all of the partners, the public sector, the private sector, the educational communities really have to be talking about that. How do we become more resilient? How do we, just as you says, include, we, we have a, 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 respond, or a recovery, uh, uh, RSFs, a number of them, uh, recovery support functions working pretty well here in Pennsylvania. How do we keep them going when we all hope COVID's over, right? How, how do we keep those same groups of people working for those same goals when they're not driven by the fact that there's a disaster and we really need to respond from that disaster. So I think that's the key to this. I love your idea about bringing private sector into recovery more. I think that is, that, that is one of the things that I wrote down because I really think that has a lot to do with the, the resiliences of, of not just the communities, but really the nation, right? We have to look bigger than just little, little community by community. Thank you, sir, wonderful. And guess what, gentlemen, we have time for what I like to call the bonus round. This is the bonus round, gentlemen. I am the genie of the lamp and I'm granting wishes today. And so really rapidly, I'm gonna ask you the question of uh, if you had one wish, one wish is all you get, Director Hastings. If you had one wish today from the federal government, wish from the federal government, the sky is the limit, what would that be? What would that be, Director Hastings? I think right now for building resilient infrastructure and communities, the BRIC program is that state set aside needs to be increased to like a per capita formula like many other programs are or, or thresholds are with the federal government. I'd say no less than about 3 million. In fact, uh, I think the whole program should be kind of formula based on a combination of total taxable resources and population and will allow us to grab a little bit more of that funding as opposed to going to uh, I to say, uh, the more wealthy, affluent, coastal communities of the United States. But that was just my opinion. Sorry about that, Fisher. Check. Director Ray, what's your wish, sir? If cloning Persia Payne Hurley is not going to be on the table as a wish, if that's not going to happen, then not I think, yet. I think um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for improvement in reducing the complexity of our recovery programs and our mitigation programs. And I think similar to what some other folks have said, I think, <clears throat> I think we have lost sight of what are these programs intended to do. At the end of the day, it's to keep folks in their homes, in their communities, or help them get back there or rebuild as quickly as possible. And it has become such a administrative challenging burden for well-resourced folks to navigate these complex mitigation and recovery programs, marginalized communities who don't have these types of resources certainly can't do that successfully. So I think we, um, looking to the federal government to one, I think reduce the complexity of the program, give the states and locals more flexibility in how we implement them, and some simple things like the common disaster survivor application. How can we better coordinate all of the recovery uh, funding streams that come into a state? I think at one point early in COVID, we had 17 different funding streams to support COVID recovery or mitigation efforts, and not one of them was coordinated with the other. So how challenging that was at a state and local level to then implement well, I think we have some work to do there. Thank you, sir. Your, your wish has been noted. Director Tingle, what is your wish today? Anything, anything from the federal government. Yeah, so so those are certainly good, and 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 I'm having to to adjust a little bit on the fly because they they took a little bit of my answer, but I, I because I, I think those are I think those are right on on track. Um, I think when we when we hear that you know from FEMA and others that it's federally supported, state managed, locally executed, the program rules don't necessarily follow that follow that approach, and what we've got is federal execution rules trying to 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 you know and, and eligibility determinations and all of that and it's and it's 
it's upside down to some extent. So I, I think what we've seen in Louisiana, and, and, and this is building, I think, a, a little bit on what they've said, is, is give us the permission, give us the, the, the broad, um, let's, let's have agreement on the broad objectives of what we're trying to do, and then get out of the way. Um, and so I, I would just, and I think that, and I want to be clear, I think that overlaps exactly with what, with what the previous two directors were saying. Um, and I'm just try, trying to say it in a little bit different way uh, in terms of the closer to the ground the response and the recovery happens, the better it's going to be. And when those decisions are allowed and empowered and supported to be made you know, locally and, and at the state level, um, I just think those are better decisions and better outcomes um, and, and it's a better approach and it's following kind of the model that we say that we're, we're following. Um, unfortunately, whether it's law, policy, or just someone's opinion or preference, the programs themselves don't necessarily work that way. And so I would say empower the states, empower the locals, um, support them. Uh, let's, let's have agreement on kind of what the broad objectives of the funding are, but then let's get out of the way of execution. Thank you, sir. Gotcha. Gotcha. And Director Hastings, your, or Director Thomas, I got you already, Director yeah, Hastings. Don't try, don't try it. You don't Director like Thomas, China. he's already had his wish. He's already, Director Thomas, your wish, sir. All right. So first of all, Will, when you get, uh, when you get more Persians, sign us up for one. Okay. We'll, we'll certainly take one. And uh, listen, the other three directors really hit the hit the same concept that I was going to talk about. Two things: one is consistency in the FEMA policies, and uh, you know we've all been there. COVID, and I'm going to give them a lot of grace in COVID. We are all learning this as we're going. But in other policies, consistency would really be good. And we are pretty good at managing disasters. Give me the endpoints, right? Don't go here. Don't go here. Let me manage that disaster in between those fences. Give us the, the respect that, quite frankly, uh, our local folks know how to do this. We know how to help manage that. And uh, yeah, give us the money. Give us the sideboards and get out of the way and let us do this. Gentlemen, this has been an awesome panel. Um, I think we're at the end of our time, but I've, I've taken some great notes. And, and I, I like what you guys said on the wishes. It sounds like, you know, if you're, if you're gonna let us manage, let us manage. Make it simple, make it easy, you know, and get out of the way. And, and, and I think, you know, we've proven that you guys can handle that. And so can every state here, every state in the nation. So um, I don't, I think I'm at the end of my time. I don't see my high time, or maybe I do see my high sign that I'm out. Um, I want to- Persia, we're about to back into a break, but we can go into it for a minute or two if you have any last minute questions or um, anything for the panelists today. Well, Laura, if you've got uh, any questions for us, I think you were tracking uh, for yeah, the- one, I do. Questions. One of the questions is how do, how do you plan to include or integrate the private sector into your own plan? You mean the state operating plan, is that what you mean? Yeah, and what's the best way to do that? Or what's the best way for private private sector to get involved? Let's go to Louisiana first. What's the best way for private sector to get involved, sir? Yeah, I, I think from our perspective, it has been through working through the associations. So, so connecting with associations um, and, and trying to um, move efficiently for a, a number of organizations as opposed... And, and, this doesn't replace what locals do, right? So I don't want to. I don't want to supersede that. That locally, you know, um, our our parish partner, our municipal partner, may be working with the largest employer in their jurisdiction because that makes sense for them. And and there's a role to that. And and I certainly don't want to 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 overstep that. But when we're scaling up, kind of at the state level, I think the best way to to interact is through associations because that's that gives us the biggest bang for our buck. All right, Director Thomas, how do you want them to get involved? Well, I think if you're in Pennsylvania, it's really easy. It's on our web page. I want to, don't mean to just bail out of here, but go on the web page. You will find out how to become one of our trusted partners. We have an agreement. You're not, you know, this is not about you getting information to uh, to have a, an edge on some other business. It is really about us being partners and sharing information. 
So our website's the best place in Pennsylvania. There's a lot of information about it there. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull that that question from my boss, and I'll just put my email in the chat because that's how you're gonna get involved in North Carolina. You can email me directly or email us at beoc at nc ncdes.gov, one or the other, and we'll let you get in at whatever level. We have time for more. Do we have time for one more question, Laura? Go for it, real quickly. Do you? I don't. Do you yeah. have it, or are we done? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you had something in your back pocket. No, but I just that's it for questions. But I do want to mention that Molly from PA just put in the chat how to contact the BEOC for uh, Commonwealth. So thanks for that, Molly. Um, I'd like to thank all of the directors for being here today and Persia, the best uh, moderator as always. So thank you so much. Um, any You're closing welcome. remarks, Persia? Oh, my pleasure today, gentlemen. I want to also welcome uh, any of uh, my state counterparts that are on, the, on this panel that are listening to these directors, please, if you'll enter your uh, email address for private partners that want to connect with you on this panel. Uh, especially, or they can go to the websites that you put into the chat. That would be awesome. I want to thank every director here. Thank you, gentlemen. Wonderful. We're going to pull information straight out of your wish list, and we are going to get that genie to deliver. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.